God and um, we would like to thank you for for all coming and for those that are on the live stream we really appreciate you and appreciate your thoughts at this time uh, we're going to um, call, call brother Mose to open this meeting in prayer as we sing that chorus one more time I worship you
for the Lord, we worship you, O oh God. There is none like you, O oh God. Father, we want to say, O oh God, what Peter said, O oh God. To whom shall we go, O oh God? For thou hast the words of eternal life. And this morning, Father, we have gathered, O oh God, saddened hearts. Lord, grieving, O oh God, in the spirit, O oh God, to bid farewell, O oh God, to your faithful servant, a beloved pastor, O oh God, loving husband, to your father, O oh God, to his children, and to the fatherless, O oh God, a wonderful man, O oh God, to his families, O oh God, a true friend, O oh God, to his daughter-in-law, his son-in-law, his grandchildren, O oh God. Truly, Lord, it's a sad day for us, O oh God. Father, we are remembering, O oh God, when Job sat on that ash heap, O oh God, suffering the losses, O oh God, that he could stand up and say, Lord, that naked came I into this world, and naked shall I return to the The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord this morning. Father, we know, Lord, it's you that has taken, O oh God, at your appointed time, O oh God. And Father, we want to thank you this morning that, Lord, we could gather, Lord, this morning. We want to come at this service into your hands, O oh God. Father, we bring your servant, Lord, that we minister your word. Father, that every heart will be comforted this morning. Lord Jesus, even if, as it is a sad time for us, O oh God, but we know, Father God, that it's a time of rejoicing for your servant, O oh God, this morning. A time that he spoke about, Lord, that he lived to see, O oh God, this day to be with the saints that's gone on before, Lord. Father, I pray you would be with us this morning. Lord, you would lead us and guide us, Lord. Everything that it is said, O oh God, and done, that, Lord, it will bring glory to your precious name, Lord. Once again, we bring every heart that is bowed in your presence, Lord. You are our comforter, O oh God. We pray that you would comfort us this morning, that you'd be our portion, that you'd cover us with your blood and bless us, Father. We want to come at this service, Lord, and everything that be said and done into thy hands, O oh God. Bless us, Lord, we pray, in that mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Today we, we have gathered to bid farewell to our dear Brother Steve. But as we believe that uh, there is no gathering, there's no gathering that should be done without the preaching of the word. And the preeminence should be given to that. And today we're going to stand and sing a few songs of celebration few songs of worship, and then we hear the word of God. Amen. Shall we stand to our feet as we sing, There's a country far beyond the starry sky, that city where the Lamb is the light. Amen. Sing it with me. There's a country far beyond the starry sky, for oh, there's a city where there never comes a night. If we're faithful, we shall go there by and by. In that city where the Lamb is the light. In that city, in that city where the Lamb is the light. In that city, in that city where there cometh no night. Have a mansion. Bye. 
of sunshine, but we know that God will be changed to clouds and rain until we go to that city where the Lamb is alive. This promise, amen. Amen. As we sing this cor- this hymn, When Peace Like a River, amen. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attended my way. When See
Satan should buffet. Oh, though Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Amen. Let this blessed assurance come true. Do you believe this? Amen. That Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. Claim it this way. Sin, oh, the bliss. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glory. Yes, Lord. Consider this thing. My sin, not in part, amen. In part, but the whole. worship him. Our dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you, Lord, and in your matchless name, Lord Jesus. We glorify you, Lord Jesus, for you are our, our King, Lord Jesus, our Savior, Lord Jesus, our strength in time of trouble, O oh God, our rock of offense, Lord, our shield and our buckler, Lord, the author and the finisher of our faith, O oh Lord Jesus. The sword of the Spirit, Lord Jesus, that comes and divides, Lord Jesus. 
Lord, that you have come and revealed yourself to us in this day, O oh Lord, that we might have this hope, Lord Jesus, this faith, Lord Jesus, this evidence, Lord Jesus, that we stand in your presence today, O oh God, knowing, O oh Lord Jesus, that we have this promise, Lord Jesus, and we glorify your name, Lord. Lord, there is no other people on the face of this earth, Lord, that can claim it as well with our souls, Lord Jesus. No death, Lord. No life, Lord Jesus. No pain, no sorrow, no agony, Lord Jesus, can stand before your throne, Lord Jesus. We have truly passed from death unto life, Lord Jesus. Eternal life, Lord God. And we stand before you, Lord Jesus, Lord, as trophies of your grace, Lord. Trophies of your matchless word, Lord Jesus. And we glorify you, Lord Jesus. Truly, O oh Father, Lord God, we love you from the depth of our souls, Lord Jesus. We give you all the honor, Lord Jesus, all the glory, Lord Jesus, for it belongs to you, Lord Jesus. It is nothing of ourselves, Lord, nothing of our own works, Lord Jesus. But it is not I, but Christ, Lord Jesus, that dwelleth within me, O oh Father. And Lord, today, Lord Jesus, as we abide in your presence, Lord, we give you honor, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, Lord God. And we worship you from the depth of our souls, Lord Jesus. It is our desire, Lord Jesus, that you would take, Lord Jesus, the words of that we speak, Lord, the lives that we live, Lord Jesus, and may it bring honor and glory to your name, Lord Jesus. And today we stand before you, Lord, and worship you with all of our hearts, Lord, with all our souls, Lord, with all our might, Lord Jesus. Thou art worthy, Lord. Thou art worthy, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. As we hand the service over to our dear Apostle Alistair Francis, let's sing, Lead Me, Lord. Lead me, Lord, and I will follow. Lead me, Lord, I will go. You have called. stand once again for the reading of the word of the Lord. <clears throat> We're going to read from 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11 to 15. The word of God reads like this. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah and fell from him, that fell from him, and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? When he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over 
And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Amen. The Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. We like to greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a great privilege for me to be speaking here at the funeral service of Pastor Stephen Francis. This is probably not the way I would have imagined it. Probably someone else preaching and me sitting there with the families. But such as it is, it is my honor to do so and um, appreciative of the opportunity to do so. So today I would like to take a title my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And we're also going to come to a special message to the church at the end. So anybody who knew Brother Stephen Francis well knew two things about him. One, he loved the word of God more than anything else in the world. There was nothing that disappointed him more when he went to weddings and funerals if the word wasn't preached in its strength. And if it was all about traditions and jokes and useless words, he considered it such a waste of time. Number two, if you knew him well, then you know this. The greatest impression in Brother Stephen's ministry was the revelation of the seven seals. And the church can say amen. And all the types and shadows that expressed it. So in honor of him, we have to give him his heart's desire especially at this funeral. We are going to preach the word. I'm not here to make a tribute. The tributes are later. We are going to preach the word. So the story of Elijah and Elisha, as you might know, the Lord told Elijah that he had three things to do. His commission was to anoint Elijah, Elisha, who would be the one who would take over from him. He was to anoint Jehu, who was going to bring judgment upon Ahab's house, and he was going to anoint a king who would also be involved in the uh, political situation of Israel. But what we do realize is Elijah's ministry ended with Elijah only fulfilling one third. Elijah only got to anoint Elisha. The other two parts of the commission was Elisha's doing. Elisha anointed Jehu, and Elisha anointed the king. If you know anything about this day, that we have had an Elijah ministry in this day, it means that the fulfillment of that type shows that the Elisha ministry produced two-thirds of Elijah's commission. And if you as this church that lived in this time under the revelation of that seal and the ministry of the third Paul, of the open book, then you know that what has been done has been done according to the Elisha ministry. If you had to look at just the meanings of the names, the meanings of the names of Elijah and Elisha and compare it to Christ, I think you might see it on the screen. Elijah means my God is Jehovah or Yahweh is God. Elisha means God is salvation. Two closely knit names and yet two different ministries. Elijah, my God is Jehovah, Yahweh is God. Elisha, God is salvation. It's amazing that Elisha has the same meaning as Jesus. Jesus in the Greek. Or Yeshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. The names of Elisha and Christ, or Jesus Christ, are the same meaning, which shows you, according to the ministry, the bride who was, took the mantle of Elijah is continuing the work of salvation, which is of Christ Jesus. Amen. Not the forerunner, but the very coming of the Lord himself. Glory to God. So the ministry of the Son is the chosen earthly vessel that Jehovah himself can live in 
the corporal body of God on earth, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not what you were taught in this place? Is that not what you believe? Amen. So let's get to this story. It's a very beautiful story. And it's knowing this and accepting this, that the mantle of Elijah, the prophet of the hour, has fallen upon the bride, and you've taken that mantle. There is a purpose your life, your ministry has to produce. Amen. So the first thing we notice is, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire that parted them both asunder. There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire that parted Elijah and Elisha, right? That what was revealed to Elisha. Now what happened was, on the journey to Jordan, Elisha asks Elijah, please, can I have a double portion of your anointing, your blessing? And Elijah, the prophet, says to him, you can have what you want, provide it. You see what takes place at the coming of the Lord, at the going away. You must have a revelation of the rapture. You must have a revelation of the translation. That means we as message people cannot fulfill the, the two-thirds of Elijah's commission unless you see the revelation of the rapture. And I'm not talking about Pentecostal revelation of the rapture. I'm talking about what was revealed under the seventh seal that was open in this day. Amen. You cannot fulfill your purpose unless you see the revelation. And please, Pentecostalism is not the revelation. In the message, isn't it amazing that in the prophet's entire ministry, he comes right to the end, almost the time before he dies, and God reveals the rapture? And in there, he said, the rapture will be a revelation to the bride. The rapture will be a revelation of the bride. If it was just anything like all the other churches believe in Pentecostal belief, if it was that, then why would it be a revelation to the bride? What's a revelation about Christ, giant Jesus coming in the sky, clouds, him standing there, and all the people floating up to heaven? What's a revelation about that? There's no revelation in that. Right? That's traditions brought on by a church. You have to see translation. You have to see what separated them both asunder. You have to see the symbolism of the chariots of fire and the horsemen thereof. Glory to God. You know, I must tell you this. When Brother Steve was in hospital and they told us what was going to happen on Tuesday, you know, I had no idea what was going to happen with the, or what, what we were preaching. Um, and the, the hospital phoned us and told us we could send audios to Brother Steve, and while he was on the ventilator, they would play our audios. And I had no idea what to say. And I just didn't even want to speak my grief. I just spoke the scripture, and I just said, my opening words to him was, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And then I told him, I wish I was there with you for you to place your hand on, on my head and give me your blessing. But I know I have it because you have passed down the word to us and I made him a promise that his church would be taken care of while he recuperates in hospital. That was just my message to him. But for some reason, that scripture stuck in my heart in the last three weeks and I couldn't get it out. But I'm thankful to God. And there's a purpose for us speaking about it today. So notice it didn't say, for a lot of people who read your Sunday school books and your picture books and you see Elijah being taken away in a chariot of fire and horses of fire, that's false. The Bible does not say he was taken up in a chariot or by the horses. Go and read it. He was taken up in the cloud, in the whirlwind. But the Bible says the horses and the chariot separated them. The revelation is what separates them, what divides the dimensions. Glory to God. It represented the power to divide two dimensions asunder. How will you know the rapture? You need to see the power it takes to divide two, two dimensions asunder, to, to take us from this one to the next one. That's why the rapture must be a revelation to you. It also represented the presence of God and the great revelation upon the anointed vessel on earth. We had to see 
the importance of Elijah in his day. Elisha was the only one for his day who received his revelation. When all the prophets, remember those prophets that saw him? They were all real prophets, men with prophetic gifts. But Elisha was the only one who saw the revelation of the rapture. Somebody say amen. He was the only one. And when they came back, go look at the type. The, the prophet said, where's your mentor? Where's his body? We, we should go back and get it because that was tradition. He said, well, go back if you want. And they went back with their traditional understanding of the rapture and the resurrection. They went looking for a body. And this one prophet who knew the revelation, who saw it, knew they were wasting their time. The other anointed prophets of the day did not have the revelation that was given to the Elisha ministry. That should make your heart leap. Number two, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Notice how Elijah went up, right? Not by chariot. In every picture I've seen, the artist paints Elijah taken up in the horse with the chariot and horse of the fire, but this is not what the scripture said. From this interpretation of this, we had, you know, songs like Swing Down Chariot, Let Me Ride, I Won't Have to Cross Jordan Alone, Swing Low, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. He wasn't taken with the chariots. Obviously, it's not wrong to sing these songs, but they'll mean so much more with the right revelation. Amen. Also, the chariots and horses of fire are around the one who sees it. Amen. Elijah tells Elisha, you will receive a double portion of this revelation if you can see it too. Of course, at the time, Elisha didn't know what Elijah was talking about until he saw it. And then, when the dimensions were divided asunder, the Bible says he saw Elijah no more. No return ministry of Elijah. That's what the type says. The prophet goes off the scene. We see him no more. This is as emphatic as any type can be. No, Brother Benham returning with tent vision. What was incomplete in Elijah's ministry is completed in Elisha's ministry. Number four, he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the, the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, which means the bride puts off her own clothes and is now dressed in the mantle of Elijah. Amen. This was the secret desire of the prophet. Present stage of my ministry, well, Paragraph 122, well, all men has forsaken me, but there's one thing, he stood by me, one thing. I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision that's happened down there at the river. I've stayed true to it. He's been true to me. I'm trusting in him someday, I don't know when, for a crowning of my ministry. I'll just stay as true as I could be. I don't know what it'll be, I don't know when it'll be, but when he's ready, I am. Now look here, I hope he'll crown my ministry with this of letting me take the clothes of the word and dress his bride in the clothes of the word and for his righteousness. I hope he'll crown me and let me stand there on that day saying, behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Are you dressed with the mantle of Elijah? So these, the, the fifth point, they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground. Here, look at the type. The other prophets come to Elisha and bow themselves to the ground. What that means is, these were prophets who Elisha, they saw Elisha coming in the power. They saw him strike that seven seal, open the book up to himself and read it and walk in the revelation. They saw the same thing happen. All of them came bowing down, shows other ministries recognizing the power and the authority that is resting upon the ministry of the bride. Thereafter, we see this dispensation of time in which Elisha's ministry takes over in secret. Elisha was not as open as Elijah was. Elisha's ministry took off in secret, stayed in that little house there, and people came to him. He, uh, he was sitting there, and Naaman the leper comes to him, and he doesn't even go out to pray for Elisha like Elijah would do. He just sent a word. Here's the mystery. Go and follow it. And, of course, the people get upset with that ministry. But if they want the salvation, they've got to take it. Amen. 
So this ministry of Elisha takes place in secret. Remember, Elijah was commissioned by God to anoint Hazael, king of um, Syria, Jehu, and Elisha. He met Elisha first, anointed him, and then the Lord revealed to Elijah that it was time for him to decrease and Elisha to increase. So Elijah had not finished his commission, but Elisha would finish the Elijah commission. Does that even strike you in this day? See, that's the thing. People make so much about the tradition of the past. But you have the commission to finish two-thirds of the Elijah commission. Glory to God. Elisha's revelation of the rapture filled him with power of the resurrection and the rapture, such that he was able to exercise that power of that revelation throughout his ministry. Let's look at those things. You know, a lot of people look at the prophet's ministry and think, so powerful, so many things that were done. And yet you don't realize what is done under the ministry of Elisha. 2 Kings 2, we're not reading the scripture, I'm going to run through it quickly. Elisha heals the waters. He uses a cruise of salt in the spring. The spring was barren, causing the land to be barren. I'm not going to preach all this now. You need to type it out while you're sitting there. He healed a barren spring with salt, an unlikely mystery. Which one of us would think that is even possible? I mean, does that even work in the world today? Who heals a barren spring with salt? But apparently under the, Eli the Elisha ministry, it was done. And it healed the barrenness of the land. You are the salt of the earth. Elisha, 2 Kings 4, multiplies the widow's oil. Now, Elijah multiplied the meal and the oil for three and a half years. Did you know Elisha multiplied the oil indefinitely? Not three and a half years. She was able to pay all her debts and have enough for the rest of her life under the Elisha ministry. 2 Kings 4, Elisha heals a barren womb. The woman is barren, receives a son for hosp uh, hospi uh, uh, hospitality to Elisha. She fed Elisha whenever he came through and she made a permanent dwelling place for him. By respecting Elisha, she was respecting the revelation that he had, which had the power of the resurrection and the rapture. Her womb was healed and she bore a son. 2 Kings 4, Elisha raises the dead son and the woman who was barren, of the woman who was barren. As Elijah's ministry had the power of the resurrection, so did Elisha's. Elisha did exactly what Elijah would do, except under this ministry, the boy sneezes seven times before rising from the dead. 2 Kings 4 again, Elisha heals poisoned food and multiplies bread, food that was poisoned, doctrine of the church that was poisoned by false ministries, false interpretation, creeds and dogmas, by the ministry of the bride is cleansed, cleaned out. Then he further multiplies the bread. He extends and expands the revelation of the word to the people. Is there any end to this message getting any better? There is no end. It's unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. We can go through lockdown and do seven services a week, and it's still as fresh as the day that we first received it. 2 Kings 5, Elisha has the word to cure leprosy. Has the word. Not laying on of hands, not making a big scene, not having praise and worship services and getting people riled up. Just the word. Go and do as the revelation suggests, and you will have what your heart wants. And Gehazi, the servant to Elisha, tried to make money off the rich through Elisha's ministry, trying to make money of this revelation, and he was struck with the same leprosy that that man was. Don't even try. 2 Kings 6, Elisha makes an iron axe float. The head. This is amazing. Elisha was now mentoring other prophets, and they all were living around in the same dwellings that Elisha was. But these prophets wanted some leg room. They wanted some uniqueness to their own ministry. They wanted to stray from the revelation that Elisha had. So they said, we want some freedom. Can we go off and fend for ourselves? It's a little stifling being here around you talking about the opening of the seventh seal, the open book, and the coming of the Lord, and the bride becoming Christ. It's a bit stifling. We like our own way. Of course, they went took their axes and tried to build their own dwellings. And this one prophet swings the axe and the iron head falls into the, the lake and, and sinks. 
and now he's got nothing more to build with. How typical. And he's a prophet, and he can do nothing. And of course, Elisha comes there, and the master of the Jordan, <laughs> on many levels, causes an iron axe head to float to the surface. They realized they cannot survive without the Elisha ministry. Second Kings 6, Elisha discloses Syria's plans to the king. Discernment of the Elisha ministry. Elisha was able to discern any impending danger against the church at any time. Second Kings 7, Elisha prophesies the end of famine. The kingdom becomes evil under hardships, forsaking God and becoming cannibals. Do you ever think that could happen? Look at the madness in the world today. These are the conditions we're living in. In that time, people were becoming cannibals because of famine. Spiritually, even the king began to lose his mind because of the severe famine. Elisha brings an end to the famine that caused such wickedness and restores the kingdom to its right mind. If you want a purpose in this life, from this day on, you should be restoring sanity to the insane people out there in the streets of this place. That's what the message has commissioned us to do. The ministry of the bride can restore the madness of any church that respects the salvation. Second Kings 7, Elisha anoints Hazael, fulfilling Elijah's commission. Second Kings 9, he anoints Jehu, who will bring judgment to Ahab's family. Ahab was the Pentecostal let down who made leagues back with the beast of Revelation 13. And every son of it had to be killed because they used the pure Pentecostal anointing and word for their own gain and for power. And the word has to crush it by truth, by humility, by honesty. 2 Kings 9, Jehu kills Jezebel under his chariot wheels and the dogs eat her. Jezebel is the type of the world ecumenical system. The influence was brought down and crushed in every church of the elect by evangelistic ministries anointed with the powerful anointing of Elisha. That's who Jehu represents. 2 Kings 10, Jehu destroys Ahab's sons and all the worshipers of Baal. That means you, under the Elisha ministry, are supposed to get rid of every single Pentecostal denominational idol from among you, traditions that hold you down, traditions of prayer, of worship, of reading the scriptures, of interpreting it by any other doctrine or theolo theology. You're supposed to crush it because that's what this ministry is anointed with. The end time evangelism, paragraph 222. Getting the bride ready, he says, that's what it is. Now we're going to end right here by saying this. The end time message is to get the bride ready and prepared for the rapture. What can it do? According to Malachi 4, is bring them back to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Bring them back to the faith of the fathers, the Pentecostal part in the restoration time. I will restore, saith the Lord. That's real end time evangelism. There is one last thing that stands out in this ministry of Elisha. 2 Kings 6. That's the chariots of fire. The Syrians go to Dothan to surround Elisha. Remember, he was discerning their every move. Someone came to the Syrian king and said, there is a prophet there. There is a ministry in there who seems to always be one step ahead of us. Every time we try something. So they realized the fight was not with the armies. The fight was to get that prophet. To get that prophetic ministry, we need to crush him and destroy that ministry. So they surround the city. And Elisha's as calm as can be. Servant has anxiety and he's running around. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Elisha's servant is suffering from anxiety. That's what happens with believers who haven't gotten into the open book. Every time there's some issue, you're filled with anxiety and you can't cope. 2 Kings 6, 15-17. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host, that means an army, compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. They had their own horses and chariots. And his servant said, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, Elisha is not praying for himself. Lord, open his eyes. 
Let him see the revelation I saw in the river that day. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Round about Elisha. What does this tell you? That proves that the chariots and horses of fire had never left Elisha from the first day he saw it. That tells you if you see the revelation of the seventh seal, the coming of the Lord in this day, the third pool opening up to you, the book be coming down to the hands of the believers. If you see it from the day you see it, it is with you and around you. They remained with him. His word was always filled with resurrection power. Take any ministry in this message who preaches from that open book. Every time he speaks, he speaks in the anointing and the power of that book. But those around him could have their eyes opened. Some more to see what Elisha saw. Some more. They could. This type means that Elisha's eyes are constantly open to the revelation of the mystery. You read the Bible, the types pop out. You read the scripture, you read the message, whatever is relevant and meaningful for the day pops out at you. There's no labor in it, there's no working for it, there's no trying to make it up. It's always there with you. But this also proves that others under that ministry, if he could open a, a believer filled with anxiety, if he could open his eyes, then it means everyone around Elisha desiring that ministry can have their eyes open to it too. 2 Kings 14, Elisha's bones have power to restore. 2 Kings 13, 21, And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, this is after Elisha had died. After Elisha has died. They spied a band of men and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And you know the story. He was revived. To me, this proves that even at the death of a saint, under the ministry of that Elisha anointing, there is resurrection power in it. His voice will live on. His anointing will live on. His life will live on. And it will give others hope, other youth hope, other communities hope. It will raise them up out of the death of their, their complacency and laziness and lift them up into faith. We had that example in our day. In the message, the countdown, paragraph 59 to 60, he says it's called the eagle age in the Bible. God calls his prophets eagle age. We realize over in the Bible, we find in Malachi 4, that they were promised in the last days. He likes his prophets to eagles. He calls himself eagle. He is the great Jehovah eagle. He's able to achieve to himself a bride. He's going to, in the last days, be able to get a bride that with the ministry that so exactly like a man and his wife becomes one, when Jehovah gets his people like him, then he lives in his people, they are one. That's what this message is supposed to produce. Modern events made clear by prophecy, paragraph 263. Notice now they had done to him just exactly what the prophet said they would do. Just as they are going to do this very same day in the Laodicean age, if you want to look at Revelation 3, blind, naked, and don't even know it, turning Christ when he reveals begins to reveal himself into the seed form again the same one that went into the ground come back to be the bride the same one that went into the ground come back to be the bride what are you waiting to see if you're waiting to see what Pentecost is waiting to see you have missed the chariots of fire and the horsemen thereof there's Elijah telling you when Jehovah gets his people to be like him, he will live through them. And here he says, when he begins to reveal himself into the seed form, the same one that went into the ground comes back to be the bride. And just the bride and the groom is the same flesh and blood, the same ministry, the same things, doing just exactly what he done, the same spirit. He's not saying, you and I must go make 5,000 people feed on, on fish and, and bread. He's not asking us to raise Lazarus from the grave. There are far greater things that are needful in this time, in 2021, than feeding hungry bellies, like other nonprofit organizations do. Feed them, hung feed them hungry bellies for one day, and what happens the next day? They're still stuck in sin. Going around, cooking food for them, just giving, just 
feeding that, that beast nature. Give me food, give me food. How do we know? They followed Christ across the sea and asked him for food again. Then they tried to trick him and say, if you are really him, show us the manna from heaven. They were not interested in manna from heaven. They still wanted food for their bellies. That's the kind of generation we have here who want handouts from a church, who want a church to take away their problems and ease their pain. Nobody's desiring the word, the truth. Nobody wants in their souls the real truth to live by, to live by integrity and honor and justice. And that's what you were commissioned to, to give to the people of this world today. That's what the Elijah, the Elisha ministry has to produce. Just the bride and groom is the same flesh and blood, the same ministry, the same things, doing just exactly what he done, the same spirit. Not those miracles, the same life expressed. Glory to God. In closing, I want to give you the last message of Elisha. And it's the message to the church here in Newcastle. Second Kings 13. Righteous King Joash runs into Elisha's room. Elisha is dying. Amen. Elisha is he's weak. Let's read it. Second Kings 13, verse 14 to 19. I'm closing now. It says, Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. He became sick. Listen, this is Elisha. With the power of resurrection in his ministry, having accomplished all we told you, and then he gets sick with a sickness that was going to kill him. Yes, you are not above sickness. Sickness is just there. If it's going to take you, it's going to take you because your work has been done. It's as simple as that. You're not above it. And you don't need to shout a hundred uh, hallelujahs to God to try and weasel your way out of it. If it's your time to go, it's your time to go. You just better make sure your purpose is done as best as you could have. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. On his deathbed, a man who comes to him stands next to him and sees the chariots of fire and the horsemen thereof, which means at his death day, he could, the man standing next to him could see dimensions separating. Like Brother Bosworth woke up and started shaking hands with saints who had gone on before. Dimensions were separating right there. Glory to God. And Elisha said, Elisha, lying dead, could barely move. Lying sick, sorry. He says to King Joash, take bow and arrows. And Joash took bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand on the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. You are Joash. You have witnessed an Elisha ministry in your midst, Newcastle. Take the bow and arrows. But it doesn't end there. He said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. Here comes the, 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 the revelation through the ministry. You have the arrow of the Lord. You have the direction. You have the purpose. You have the prophecy to tell you you will fulfill your purpose. The arrow of the Lord is in your hand. He makes the shot. Joash is so happy. Then he said, take the arrow. So Elisha tells Joash, take the arrows. And he took them. He said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice. That means he took the arrow and hit the ground three times. And stayed. And Elisha got upset. The man of God was wroth. Wroth means terribly upset. And he said, thou should have smitten five or six times. Thou hast, then hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. 
Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. My message to you, saints of this church, smite upon the ground. You have had the ministry that placed its hand on the arrow in your hand. Smite upon the ground. The message to you, you have all had an Elisha ministry in your midst. Your pastor, friend, and brother was one who preached the revelation of the true rapture, the revelation of the open seal, the seventh seal, the opening of the seventh seal, the third pole ministry, and from the open book. What are you still doing dabbling with Pentecostalism and denominationalism? What are you still doing dabbling, dabbling with men's traditions and other things of this world? Smite upon the ground. Even now at his death, we see the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And the arrow is in your hand to shoot. His guiding hand was upon your life all these years. Now at his death, go out and take the arrow and smite upon the ground. But don't be a Joash and smite just three times. How much do you really want it? Young man, young woman, if you're living in sin, how much do you really want to overcome that secret sin? Your Syrians. Smite upon the ground for the arrow is in your hand. Older folks, how long have you been sitting around with no purpose in the word? Waiting to come in here every week, week in and week out, listening to the pastor preach and doing nothing yourselves. Smite upon the ground, the arrow is in your hand. His friends and ministers he worked with, what do you want for your purpose in the days ahead? Smite upon the ground for the arrow is in your hand. His family, his wife, his children, his grandchildren. What are your personal Syrians? And how badly do you want to defeat them? Smite three times? No. Smite upon the ground until you are done with them. Until you have consumed them. Smite upon the ground, saints. Smite upon the ground, for the arrow is in your hand. Smite the ground, Church of Newcastle, so you can win every soul you can to the word in this place by the inspiration of the ministry whose hand was upon yours, and when you held your bow and shot the arrow of the Lord, you were given the direction and the prophecy that it should be fulfilled. Smite upon the ground. Let us stand together. And may the Lord add a blessing to his word. Let's sing peace like a river as we hand over to Brother Liam. Peace like a river, love like a fountain, the winds of your spirit are blue. Take it a little higher. Oh, peace like a river. Let it flow through your soul, saints. Love like a mountain. The wind of your spirit. Glory to God is blown. Joy like a fountain. Joy like a fountain. Healing stream of life. Healing stream of life. Sing, come, Holy Spirit. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Let your fire. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Yes, come, Holy Spirit. Let your fire fall. Let's praise the Lord.
Christ be your name, dear Lord. Lord, we commit this time to you right now. We appreciate your presence with us, Father God. We love you with all our souls. We thank you for the anointing that has come down in this day by the word of the messenger of the end time, Lord. Our lives have been transformed. Our lives have been renewed. We have seen the chariots of fire and the horsemen thereof. We have lived and walked in that revelation for so many years. And we believe it will sustain us to the end, O oh God. Glory to your name. There is none like you, O oh God. Nothing is beautiful as your word, O oh God. It takes our breath away. How pure and how holy and how true and how just your word is, O oh God. We give glory to you, for you alone deserve all the praise and the worship, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the life of your sovereign. We pray, Lord, at this time, that this life would sow the seed of the word, that more may hear the truth and come to the great shelter and knowledge and cleft in the rock that is the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be your holy name. Father, we ask you to continue with us for the rest of the service and the tributes and songs would be sung. May it be blessed, Lord. May it give honor to you, not to men, but to you, dear Lord. We ask it in Jesus' precious, holy, and matchless name. Name above all names. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Steve would have actually said it's time to close the service and worship God. But as is the way we do things here, we want to actually, we have a few tributes that will be offered. And we pray your patience that you would actually listen and hear the words of uh, the various people that will speak. It has been um, a difficult time to actually get people that would be able to attend due to different circumstances. And there will be a few tributes that will be read uh, by a family member on behalf of someone else. And um, so we're going to call up uh, Declan Francis, Brother Steve's uh, grandson. He is uh, otherwise known as the Incredible was the name Brother Steve actually had for him. He's going to be reading a, a tribute that's on behalf of Ravi Salman, who is um, my dad's nephew. Um, so we're going to call Brother Declan up. John and all my cousins and their children. Our deepest and sincere condolences go out to his family and to all those who felt he was their guiding light. I would like to be a bit selfish and share my experiences with Uncle Steve in hope that it will capture a semblance of our relationship and to some extent my extended family. I have rarely come across a person always greeted you with such warmth and love, making you feel special and he did it to all who found themselves within his presence. Our journey started together when my family relocated to Newcastle in the 1970s. We would regularly see Uncle Steve and his family, and one of his most enduring qualities was his quick wit and his ability to make me laugh. This became an entrenched character trait of his, always looking at the bright side of life, and yet I, for one, certainly never heard him complain about life always smiling, fully engaged, sincere, and could transcend all age groups to hold conversations. All the children in his life 
most certainly were the true beneficiaries of these attributes because he simply loved kids. Many years later, I was lucky enough to have lived with Uncle Steve and Auntie Jenny for a few months, and soon enough, I was drafted into the family as one of the sons. Amongst all the fun we had, one of my most striking observations was our regular family meetings to discuss family issues. Everyone was free to express themselves, and let me stress, I had never seen him angry in those sessions or lose his composure, which was a quality of his that I observed through my entire life. It had such a profound impact on me that we have adopted it into our family. I guess I'm saying he demonstrated a way of life through living his life, more than being prescriptive or instructive to others. His commitment to his faith was unwavering, and all that knew him will bear testament. When I decided to get married, I chatted with my fiance and asked him and asked if Uncle Steve could officiate the ceremony. Naturally, she agreed, because who better to bless our marriage than my Uncle Steve, even though we are Hindu. When we got to Newcastle, we had a Christian wedding. I would have expected nothing less because it was yet another example of his approach to life. I will certainly miss my quiet time with him on the golf course and the many hours of wisdom. I could go on for hours talking about my uncle, but when I think about Auntie Jenny, it is with pain in my heart that I say this family has lost a very dear human being. One never knows when your time has been spent on this earth, but I guess the more important question is, what have you done with your time? For me, Uncle Steve spent his time dedicated to uplifting the quality of lives of others, and there are fewer more noble purposes of living one's life. We pray that God lays his hands upon you and our family as we journey through this difficult phase of life. Thank you, Brother Declan. Okay, our next tribute is from Brother Mike Slater. And uh, just a little bit about Brother Mike. He is the longest standing member of this assembly. And this assembly started many years ago. It started off with four families. And Brother Mike Slater, we remember him. He has the most incredible laugh that we've ever, ever had. Um, so we're going to call him up because he's fondly remembered for that laugh. Brother Mike. you all. I wish to greet each and every one in that lovely and matchless name, a name which is superior to all other names, a name that has brought us hope, brought us joy, a name that has even went across our color line, a name that has made us Christians name that has made us uh, the children of the most high God, irrespective of what we look like. I met Brother Steve way, way back in 19, early 80s. I was a member of uh, assembly of uh, Beatrice Street Assembly in um, Durban, and he used to come, and then uh, I was serving under Brother George, who also basically picked me up from the I would say from the street, so to speak, because I was a mic of no fixed address at that point in time. I was just, a, 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 what, what, what can I say, like a vagabond from one corner, from so much so that I stayed with so many people. And then uh, people didn't have to tell me when it's time to go now, because they just see their attitude, then I knew it's time to go now. So I stayed with people like that, and then uh, I met Brother Steve, he used to come and preach there. I like this man, he was so different. I was saying, you do not see color. I just saw you. I just saw a servant of God. And 
Then we used to come up and down to me and Brother George and Brother Ambrose and Brother, let's talk about four or five of us. We used to come in a, a little uh, Volkswagen Beetle, come up to Newcastle. My word, you know how uh, our type of people, we never used to, we were not exposed to such good food. The country used to stay Jenny's house. That time, Liam was in nappies. I remember properly. They were staying right on top where that reservoir is. So he was in nappies. His mother used to just put him in a room there, and he'll open a chest of drawers there, and leave. And his mother will cook for us. We never ate food like that in our lives. Sister Jenny prepared food like we ate our stomachs sick. We ate and ate and ate. I've never met a loving couple like that. You know, like. Brother Steve loved his family, he loved his wife. As I say, then he, um, later on, I came up to Newcastle. As I say, I had nothing, absolutely nothing. But, uh, then I met my wife, and uh, we got married. Brother Steve organized a, a marriage. He baptized my wife first. We got married. We had a wonder, out of that marriage, uh, three wonderful daughters were born. And you can see how pretty my daughter is. She doesn't look like me. Quite pretty now. <laughs> and uh, the house, we were blessed and we carried on. And Brother Steve, one thing I can say, he lived by an example. I've never, he endured so many trials. If you see the life of Paul, the life of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, even the life of the present day messenger, Brother Steve went through all those trials, but he took them at his stride. He never changed. He, to him, any person was a soul. He was just not a man. He was just, it was, it was a soul that he needed to be, see God. He, he was just more, he wasn't worried about all the pomp and the grandeur which the ministers of today uh, go for. He wanted to just win souls for the kingdom of God. He just wanted to show people. He never worried about which, from which class you are from, whether you are white or you are black or you are Indian or you are colored. He never defined people. He defined a person by the soul. That's how Brother Steve was. So when I came to Newcastle, it was my first time to see such kind people. I remember there was another brother. Uh, Brother Siva, yeah, and uh, we came to his house. We, they were staying in uh, some flat there, uh, Isco flats. Hey, I've never seen people like this. He opened his cupboard to take all his groceries. He put in that bucket that we were traveling in because we used to go around preaching and spend all his last and spend whatever they have. That's how the kind of people that stayed with them and they stayed with Brother Steve in his own house. And uh, as I say, he even got me married. And then, uh, you know, like culturally, you got to um, get some elder to go and represent you to the family of the girl you're interested in. So Brother Steve was my representative to my in-laws. And then uh, naturally, my mother-in-law wasn't very, very impressed with me because I'm not nice looking. And I don't know whether it was that, but. <laughs> 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 but any, uh, well, I understand now because I've got daughters. I wouldn't like any Tom, Dick, and Harry coming to my house, coming to take my daughter. So I understand how my mother-in-law felt because uh, you, you want to know where this guy comes from, who is he, and Brother Steve did such a good job. So whenever I was going through my marriage, I always said, I, wanna, I don't want to do this man down for what he's done for me. So we carried on and then uh, we served we, I interpreted for him because uh, I can speak Zulu better than some Zulus. Uh, I speak, I can write it, I can speak, and then I grew up in a Zulu culture, so I speak Zulu quite well. So I was some kind of asset to him in this set. But Steve, as I say, he looked at people the way he needed souls for the kingdom of God, not for as I say, for him to buy himself a big Mercedes Benz or Jago or whatever, but he just wanted souls to be won for the kingdom of God. And then he actually, then uh, 
one of the uh, uh, things that I've seen about Brother Steve, I've known Brother Steve, as I say, my daughter, my youngest daughter is now 30 years old. I've known Brother Steve for all those years. The love that he had for Sister Jenny when I first met him, he had, him, he had that lo love up until last. And Brother Steve was never, ever caught in a, any or, or, or seen in any uh, situation which compromised like what uh, ministers of today you hear, oh, Brother so and so was seen with Sister so and so in a very not so nice way. Brother Steve remained true to his family. He remained true to his wife. He remained true to the church with all the storms that he, fell, he, he faced. I'm yet to see a man that can go through what I've been in this message for quite a while. I mean, I'm an old man. I'm 65 years old. So I've met them all. Not all, but I've met quite a few. Brother Steve has been so constant and so stable and so honest. He preached the word uncompromising, yet he will tell you if you've done wrong. That no, brother, that is not right. And he will... I've never met such a true man. It will be... I've said this, I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to cast stones on anyone, but it's very hard to replace Brother Steve. It's going to be very, very, very hard. But God has always had a plan. He's always got a plan now because when God, when Moses was taken away and on that journey to the promised land, God in his, the Bible says in the book of Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 5, it says, God called Joshua the son of Nun to carry on with the journey. And he says, the Bible says, my servant Moses is dead. But it didn't mean that the work of God had to stop. It meant the job, the, 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 the work of God must carry on. So they had to get to the promised land. Brother Branham says, we are in a first exodus. That was a first exodus. And then there's a second exodus. And then we are in the last exodus. So in this last exodus, brothers and sisters, and of which Brother Steve did such a marvelous job, it doesn't mean that now that he is gone, the work of God must stop. We, God will send Joshua, which is the Holy Spirit, and then the Bible says, I will send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will lead you to all truth until the rapture. I am grateful for what this man has made me to be. Today I've got my own comfortable home. I'm a, I'm a mic of a fixed address now. I've got my own address. You can write to me. <laughs> I've got even an uh, uh, email address. They always ask me, <laughs> they always ask me, what's your email address? I don't even know, Brother Steve, because I'm not so, I'm not such a tech technology and all that stuff. I, I even battled to fellowship in a cell phone like we do because of this COVID. But Brother Steve, I owe him big time. Now, I lost my wife uh, about 11 years. I'm not advertising. I'm not available anymore. So, and um, I lost my wife about 11 years ago. And Brother Steve always, and Sister Jenny always made sure there's food sent into my house. Same like when Sister Jenny was here. There was always, I've always had to eat. So I've never met such kind people. So this message is for real. Just like how our prophet of the hour lived the way Jesus Christ lived, that's how Brother Steve was a true ambassador, a true uh, ambassador of this message, a true Christian. Why people say call us Brennanites and false and all that? Day? It's because some of us live very false lives. But Brother Steve lived so true. You couldn't falter him. With all the trials that he faced, if, uh, what if uh, his sons will allow me to say, he bought his church with his own money. He didn't collect like what people, you, uh, you know, ministers and have uh, bakeries and all those things that selling cakes on the fair side of the street. Brother Steve did it all, not for himself, for the kingdom of God. He loved his children. He loved his church. He remembered each and every member of his church birthday. He phoned me each time it was my birthday. He phoned me. 
he phoned my daughter. My daughter was supposed to go uh, to the UK to go and work there. She got a job, everything organized, and they were prepared to, and they were going to pay uh, nice money and so on. But for some reason, then COVID came. And Brother Steve said, I prayed. You're not going. You're going to stay here. You'll get a job right in South Africa. And she got a job right in South Africa because of Brother Steve's prayer. He will be sorely missed. I personally will miss him because he never... I disagree with Brother Steve in many occasions. I disagree with him some because he, I felt that he was a bit too soft at times. I felt that he allowed uh, things that... Uh, but Brother Steve saw a soul that needed to be to make it to heaven. He need, saw a soul that needed to be happy. And Brother Steve, Steve was never a selfish man. He was worried about... Some people even took advantage of his good nature. They'll get him up at 4 o'clock, take me there, take me there. He became a taxi driver. But Brother Steve didn't look at it that way. He looked at it as a service as unto the Lord. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Brother Michael. We're going to sing a song, Jesus, I Adore You. And while we're singing, we're going to ask our Brother Emmanuel uh, to come, come forward to give a testimony or tribute. Um, Brother Emmanuel is, is uh, someone that Brother Steve actually relied on in the recent time in his ministry in this church. Um, and uh, he's affectionately known as Brother E. So as he comes up. Jesus, I adore you. Greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is um, a common saying that says, practice what you preach. My pastor and my brother, Brother Steve, never believed in that. There is also a common saying that says, God help those who help themselves. My pastor, Brother Steve, also did not believe that. Instead of believing in, you must preach what you practice. He believed in, you must practice what you preach. In other words, leave it and then preach it. Rather than preach it first and then later, leave it. Instead of believing, God helps those who help themselves. He believed that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Because if you can help yourself, then you don't need God. But that did not make him apply a little effort and then say, God will understand. But he always believed that if you do something, you do your very best or don't do it at all. He believed that whatever you are, be the best, and that's what he, he was. He was there to us. He was the best pastor, a real brother, a genuine Christian, who always did his best. 
even if he had never preached a sermon, his life was a living sermon itself. That's the brother Steve I first met in 2001. In 2021, this year, 20 years on, he was still the same brother Steve I met 20 years ago in 2001. He never changed a bit. So as many of us know that the word pastor means a shepherd, it's true that a good shepherd clo I mean, watches closely over his sheep. He ensures that they eat only sheep food. And he lays down his life for his sheep. Some of the shepherds may find it not easy to do the first two. But the last one, which is to lay your life down for the sheep, becomes a challenge. My pastor did all three without compromising. I know that my pastor used to pray for each and every one of us in the church, every day, calling us by names, all of us, one by one, every day, every year. So he was a true shepherd, he was a true leader, whose life had an impact to countless number of people, not only here in Newcastle, but in many countries around the world. My pastor, indeed, he was a living sacrifice. He was not living for himself. He was living for others. Besides many gifts that he gave us, um, even this tie that I have right now is one of many ties that he gave me. This Bible he gave me, and many other things, and many other brothers and sisters received a lot of gifts from him. We cannot finish if we can just start counting. We can't finish. But besides all those gifts that he gave us, he gave us himself. He gave us his heart, his strength, his time, his life. He gave us his best. I just want to quote the words of my prophet, Brother William Branham. He says, there's nothing, or the message that was preached in 1960 on, the, on December 25, it was Christmas Day, God's wrapped gift. My prophet says, there's nothing too good for Jesus. Give him your best, give him everything you got, your life, your soul, your being, your time, all that you have, give to him. Unquote. That's exactly what my pastor did. Now, don't mistake him with Pope Francis. He was Pastor Francis. Not a holy father, but a humble brother, and his ministry is, ref is reflected in the Bible. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So, therefore, a true pastor is a gift that comes from God. So we should be thankful to God for giving us a true pastor. My pastor was not a manufactured pastor. He was an anointed and God ordained pastor. It is said um, to note that it's not everyone who will appreciate a true pastor, though being a gift sent from God so, brothers and sisters, I do not believe that my pastor's name was Stephen by coincidence. I want to look at Stephen of the Bible. Stephen of the Bible in the book of, of Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7, the Bible says he was full of power, he was full of faith, he was full of wisdom, he was full of the Holy Ghost. But notably in chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, we see that also false witnesses were conspiring against Stephen of the Bible. People stayed up, other people against him. My pastor, Brother Stephen, like the Stephen of the Bible, was full of power, 
was full of faith. He had wisdom. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was also, like in, the, in his life journey, he experienced false witnesses conspiring against him. He experienced people being stirred against him. Stephen of the Bible had his last strength used to preach the gospel. My pastor, my brother, Pastor Steve, when he was getting sick, from his voice, one could tell that he was getting weaker. But like Stephen of the Bible, he chose to use his last strength to preach the word of the Lord. Stephen of the Bible did not preach the gospel for his own benefit, but he preached it for the benefit of the souls of the listeners, of those who were listening to him. Yet he was stoned and killed. Stoned by the very same people he loved, by the very same people he was trying to help. My pastor, my brother, brother Steve, did not escape the similar experience. Despite all the sacrifice, all the efforts, all the time he spent, not for himself, but for our spiritual benefit, like Stephen of the Bible, he was also stoned, not by the strangers, but by some of the people he sacrificed his life for. Despite him giving his all, yet there were those who were determined to stone him. But just like Stephen of the Bible, my pastor never fought back even once. Instead, like the Stephen of the Bible, when he was stoned, he kept his eyes fixated on Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, lay not this sin in to their charge. That same character was displayed in my pastor, the character of Jesus Christ who forgave those who were crucifying him, and Stephen who forgave those who were stoning him. And I know that my pastor forgave all those who stoned him. And he also forgave all those who, like Paul, did not throw a stone, but were rejoicing when Stephen was being stoned. Imagine if Stephen of the Bible had cursed everyone who was there when he was being stoned. Paul, then Saul, another son of God, who did not know what he was doing at that time, was going to be cursed too. My pastor, my brother, brother Steve, I know that he truly forgave all those who stoned him and those who were rejoicing when he was being stoned because he knew that among them they are sons and daughters of God who did not know what they were doing. Knowing his, his character, I am sure he said, Lord, lay not sin to their church, for I have forgiven them. In closing, I just want to mention this. At the beginning of the COVID lockdown last year, 2020, he preached every day, seven days a week, for three straight months of the lockdown. He said, under lockdown conditions, he felt much closer to God than ever. He did not focus on the negative side of the situation. He said to us, we should not feel locked down, but we must ensure that we are locked in or shut in with God. So COVID never locked him down. Instead, it caused him to be shut in with God. It never took his life, but it took him to the presence of his heavenly father. So the enemy did not have victory over him. Instead, heaven rejoiced when the son of God came home after a long life hard battle for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a life well lived and job well done. God bless you. Thank you, Brother E. So we're now going to have a, a video that will be played. Uh, it has a few pictures that we'd like to share of uh, the life and times of our dear Brother Steve. As they prepare that, we'll sing, Oh Yes, I'm a Child of the King.
child of the king and his royal blood now flows through my veins and I who was wretched and vile now can sing oh praise God child of the king.
behalf of our family. Uh, it is an honor to stand before you. Um, it's an honor to stand before you and talk about the difference a man Stephen Francis has made in the 72 years that were given to him here on earth. I must begin by thanking each and every one of you that are here with us today, those that are watching by live streaming, and those that have sent messages and tributes. We appreciate every kind word and gesture. We'd also like to thank Newcastle Funeral Services, Mr. Matthew Shanmugam, for their kind service, and old Tim Bentley for the live streaming and the beautiful website and the tributes that you've actually seen. Over the last two weeks, we've had many tributes pouring in from many different places all over the world. What has become clear to us is the Francis family. <coughs> Their brother, <coughs> Stephen Francis, did not belong to us. We realized that he was Papa, Uncle Steve, and Dad, and so many others and had a special relationship with each person. So what I have to say today from a family perspective is but a small facet of his life and yet cause for reflection for every one of us. First, <coughs> some context of the man that lies before you. He really didn't get a great start in life odds were stacked against him succeeding in this world. He was born during troubled times. He lost his dad at the age of nine. He was an intelligent man who had to leave school in the 11th grade find work and support his family, his brothers and sisters. He would get depressed, joined political power struggles, and so much more that he would later regret in life. For most of our weak, our weak generation, our millennials, even one of these experiences becomes a reason for therapy to run away, to become abusive husbands and fathers, and splash, and splash all sorts of issues on social media. Instead, the one constant in his life is that he kept seeking the presence of God in his life. He found little comfort in customs and traditions of Hinduism and Christianity alike as he searched for peace. He found joy that search, that search would be the beginning of a man that lived devoted to the word of God and to God only. In that search for peace, he found God. He found the love of his life, Sister Jenny. He found true fatherhood and he, with his children. He found true friendship and kinship in some of his minister friends. He found extreme joy in his grandkids. He often said that he wished they came first. He found happiness and most importantly, he found his purpose and fulfilled it. What was this purpose, you might ask? What is it 
Was it the thousands of sermons that he preached? Was it that he had been called to the ministry? Was it the great conventions that he was a part of? Was it to express the many wonderful understandings of the scriptures as he would so often do in his quiet way? No. As Brother Branham said, it's better to live a sermon than to preach one. I believe, therefore, that this was his purpose and it has been fulfilled. Reflecting on the Bible, we see Moses fulfilled his purpose by taking the Israelites out of Egypt. Joshua, the Holy Ghost, fulfilled his purpose by placing Israel into the promised land. But thereafter, the children of Israel would be falling into sin and idolatry. Then God would send a servant whose actions, not words, actions, not words, would judge and provide a standard that people would recognize and live by in order to find peace in that day. The Bible would say, and he judged Israel 20 years, and the land had rest. These judges were not prophets. No, they were rather ordinary men who took God at his word, and their lives became a standard, the evidence of things not seen. If we were in the days of the judges, I would say that the life of this man, Stephen Francis, the life that he lived, judges us these 48 years by his actions, not his words. So today, my tribute to the man that lays before you is also a challenge to everyone who hears these words. We've received many tributes and testimonies about my dad from all around the world saying wonderful things about his ministry and his humility, but the ones that really stand out are tributes from the community. He knew all the cashiers and the packers at the regular stores in the town. He knew them by name. He would ask how their kids were doing, and he would be praying for them. It was near impossible to even go to the mall without people greeting him. It was the poor and needy that he served. When people who came, who claimed to be message believers, would ignore him. I ask you, has his life not judged us the same? He was known to be fair and respected by all people, regardless of race or religion. Despite being with any high standard of education, a local prominent high school called him to chair a hearing in a sensitive school matter. The local cricket fraternity would call him to run the cricket association whenever there were serious issues to resolve. He was an extremely competitive man in every sport that he played. He was a perfectionist. He really excelled at cricket, soccer, swimming, tennis, you name it, we, and we were privileged as kids to play with him. The remarkable thing is that in every sport, he was never disrespectful. And he was always a good sportsman. We should ask ourselves, what is our reputation in the communities that we live in? Are we known as Christians that stand for the truth and righteousness? I ask again, are we not judged by the standard set by this man's life? He stopped the man from committing suicide, by pinning him against the wall. He stopped fights in the streets, picked up injured people and take them to hospital when this generation would pass them by. He even went to court 
to plead leniency for the men that broke into this very church, into this very church building, and even invited the burglar to come to church because he saw the man's pain. Didn't see him as anything else but a victim of circumstance. Has his life not judged your humanity today? He would go and help other churches in Newcastle without trying to force people to leave those churches to attend spoken word fellowship. There was a time when a few brothers actually broke away from the assembly and formed their own assembly in Newcastle. Despite the things they said about him, he offered to help them, to establish them as an assembly, and didn't stand in their way as they approached other members of the church to join them. Has his life not judged you this day? He would apologize to people, even if he was not wrong, as his aim was always to reconcile that person to God, like Brother E said. Many years later, as an adult, he went back and apologized for the, his attitude that he showed to a family member that treated him badly as a child. He apologized to a brother for choosing to take care of his own family before attending to that brother's need. He apologized to other people for taking certain spiritual decisions that as a pastor he was entitled to. He never showed a bad attitude to anyone and never spoke ill of them at home. Yet, he received nasty messages from people and others who took to social media. Even though those people should be ashamed for touching God's anointed, Brother Steve never retaliated. He would apologize and just ask them to pray for him. Was this because he was a humble man? When he was asked what true humility was, he answered, true humility is submitting to the word. It's not about being humble. As a young man, I often thought that people who apologize when they're not wrong are actually insincere. But Brother Steve taught me that in his submission to the word, he would apologize never to stand in the way of that person's salvation to the word or their path back to God. His apology left the door open for that person to one day come back to him. Has his life not judged us this day? I can assure you that throughout his life, he was not swayed by money, woman, or fame. He lived a simple life, was never extravagant. He gave more than he had. He really cared for those who continued to search for God and loved the word no matter what problems they were experiencing. He died owing no man anything at all. I say these things not to bring harm to anyone, but rather to point out this rather unbelievable character of the human being that walked so humbly amongst us he took no credit for anything. Always give the glory to God. I ask, how can a man with such a terrible start to life and all the things that he experienced even during the course of being a pastor, being a Christian, wanted to give up so many times, give up in the ministry? Those are things people never, never heard from him, never saw. How can a man with such a terrible start be able to walk in such subjection to the word? It can only be God himself living in the man, Stephen Francis. Today I assure you that we are here to give glory to God for the work he has done in Brother Stephen Francis' life. He met the love of his life, Sister Jenny, and they were married for 48 years. Theirs was a love story of note. As every challenge imaginable was thrown at them, 
from extreme poverty to being disowned by family. On that note, Brother Steve could have actually been very rich if he became a brand ambassador for apple cider vinegar. But he chose not to. Yet they believed in the purpose for which they were created. And they loved each other with all of their hearts and never faltered. Did they have disagreements? Yes, they did. But they placed each other ahead of them. They placed each other ahead of themselves no matter what. God before them. They were a great example of a marriage. My dad never once raised his voice at my mom. He would never correct her in front of us. He taught us to respect our spouses by example. God blessed their marriage and they've had a wonderful life together by the grace of God. They were made for each other and complemented the way certain things would be handled in the church. Sister Jenny never once questioned Brother Steve's decisions regarding the church and the word. It was a true relationship of whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. I ask you married couples, has his example not set as a standard for you today? He was a very busy man as he started his ministry. He would preach eight services a week. He seeing to people's challenges at the oddest parts of the day or night. When Alistair and myself were quite young, we woke up one Saturday morning to find that my parents were nowhere to be found. We checked their beds. It hadn't been slept in. We were sure the rapture had taken place. And we'd, and we'd been left behind. In tears, we ran to Brother Joe's house a few streets away to check if they had been raptured as well. They were not. So we, we came back home to find that my parents had actually come home in the early hours of the morning and slept in the guest room so as not to disturb us. Another time they left to help someone after we had gone to sleep. They returned home to find Alistair and myself sitting in the passage, hugging our knees, and curled up in a ball, terrified at being alone. Brother Mike Slater can testify, talking about me as a toddler. Came home one day to find that my parents had been gone the whole day to help people. They left me locked in a room with my milk bottle. So that I, if I got hungry, I would drink my milk. And I played all day in the room on my own. In all of these things, no matter how busy they were with the purpose of God, as we grew, they never forgot the family prayer. We would sit around the fireplace and sing and have fellowship into the early hours of the morning. He taught us to sing, play music with his guitar and accordion, but more importantly, we were included in my dad's purpose until we found ours. As parents, are we not judged by this man's life? Part that many of you may not know, that he was a lot of fun. He had a great sense of humor, as dry as the desert. And he told the same jokes, and the same stories exactly the way he did 30 years ago over and over again. He played sport with us and the boys in the church and even played games like Scrabble and Boulder Dash with the people in the church. He encouraged other parents to do exactly the same. 
He enjoyed playing golf. And he would have some of the most amazing fellowship on the golf course on a Monday, which was his day off. He never really played golf because he actually enjoyed it, I think. But it was a safe, quiet place where he would counsel a drug addict or witness the love of God to a caddy. Some of you might know Jerome. The Newcastle golf course has had its fair share of people who was, who was struggling and received counseling from Brother Steve. There is a saying that you can never fool children and animals. Well, we used to call him the Papa Nator, as there was truly no child that would not come to him. And we even witnessed him walking into people's front yard with ferocious dogs, where they would immediately calm down and even sit next to him. It was almost as if they knew they were in the presence of God. Some of you might not know, there's a tree out here with birds. And he fed every day. They felt safe. Anyone, like in the arms of God. As a grandfather, he was blessed with 10 grandkids. And he would often say that they are, they are called grandchildren because they have such grandparents. He loved his grandchildren and couldn't wait to spend time with them. He had a special name for each one. Everyone thought they were his favorite, including his daughter-in-laws. To his grandchildren, I say, never forget your papa. Because he's passed a piece of himself to each one of you, whether you realize it or not. As, as his children, we could share many stories of how Brother Steve made the best of every moment that he had with us. Someone once told me that any man can be a father, but it takes something special to be a dad. Regardless of how busy he was, he always had time for us to answer a question or play a game or let us make mistakes so that we could learn. When he wasn't around, we understood because as a dad, our lives were filled with my dad and mom walking in their purpose. He taught us to respect all men but stand for what you believe. Even in school, he said that when our report cards would come in at the end of the year, he wasn't interested in us getting top grades. He wanted to see that we tried our best. But most importantly, he would look at the teacher's comments under the section on behavior. He wanted to say that Liam was a gentleman and a Christian. I remember when Alistair and I were naughty one day and my mom told my dad to discipline us because she'd had enough. He came into the room and he asked us, would you like a spanking with a belt or would you like me to talk to you? Of course we chose the talk. Worst mistake of our lives. Instead of scolding us, he gently put each us on each knee and then read a scripture from the Bible. And at the end of that gentle talk, I think there were no more tears left to be cried. In hindsight, we should have opted for the belt. As we grew, he allowed us to flourish in the work of God, to serve both the church and at home. He never made decisions for us, but provided guidance. He would never say, I told you so. My fondest memories were Sunday mornings before church, where we would wake up early and spend time discussing the word, and there was an atmosphere of reverence 
and a tension that you, an anticipation that was so real you could cut it with a knife. I used to think it was like standing with Moses after he came down from Mount Sinai and the light shone from his face. At the same time, he would not take it easy on, on us in our sport as he knew that you only learn when you lose. And he didn't mind giving us a solid thrashing in any game. But he would never gloat and always praised us when we stepped up. This was not a father. This was a daddy. The man God chose to raise us. It was a privilege to call him dad. So I want to tell you about a conversation I want to tell you about a conversation that I had with my kids quite a while back. They asked me at family altar one evening, Dad, why haven't we seen God? I asked him, I pretended to be upset, and I asked him, what do you mean you haven't seen God? I asked him, who am I? And when they couldn't answer, I said, I am God to you. I am God to you. Until such time that you come to the age of accountability and have a personal relationship with God, I will be God's representative to you. It's why he gave us each other, and it's a great responsibility. I told them that this is what Papa was to me. As a young man, I could not tell the difference between him and God. Has this life not set a standard for us as parents? Finally, in a sermon he preached called Finding Your Purpose, Brother Steve spoke about every tree fulfilling its purpose. But the bramble wanted to be elevated to the status of the king of the trees. Weeds are the only plants that grow out of control and want to usurp authority over the elect of God. Brother Steve was a shy, soft-spoken person who never sought the big church and was a truly happy man in the simple life that he lived. Brother Steve said that our purpose was to be the reflection of the glory of God. With what I've told you today, it is clear that in almost every aspect of his life, he had achieved that purpose. the only way this was possible was that he gave his life over to the word himself and was used of God. With the start that he had in life, his nature could not have been changed by anything other than the supernatural. In no uncertain terms, this was the word made flesh. And he dwelt among us. That sounds like something people would hesitate to say. But this is the mystery of the seven thunders, the seven seals. This is God in simplicity. This is the miracle of you. And he showed us this. Why would you live below your privileges? To our pastor, brother, dad, uncle, friend, we salute you. Soldier of God, receive your crown of righteousness. We have fought an excellent fight. Finish the course. You will be missed in this life. Rest in the arms of God and in the knowledge that he has afforded you the privilege of being the reflection of his glory. Amen. I'm now going to call my brothers. We're going to sing a song that my dad loves very much.
Bless you, saints. This is a song we learned in Tucson, Arizona. My dad loved to hear us sing. Sanctuary. He loved worship. He taught us never to sing for entertainment, especially the gospel. <coughs> we don't sing because we really didn't want to, but my sister urged us to do it because it was the favorite song that he he loved that we sang together as brothers. We learned it in Tucson, Arizona, like I said, and in Brother Isaac's church, and it was sung by two very wonderful anointed young men. And we've written uh, another verse to it, and we trust it will be a blessing. It is a song that expresses the real essence of the message of the hour. May the Lord bless you. Most people are content with just the outer core where the lives of men seem so easy and still others are content with just the altar with their sacrifice before the Lord. But that is not where he said he would meet you. You must come into the holy of holies. You must be made a reflection of Jesus Christ. You must be made in his likeness today and I will not be content until I reach that place in the holiest of all show it's his life expressed day by day and though trials come and things don't go your way you are anchored within the veil he said he would be of Jesus Christ you must be made in his likeness today and I will not be content until I reach that place in the whole You said, I will take you from your heathen lands of shame, and I will place you in your own land. You said, I will take away from you 
your stony heart of flesh and a brand new heart will take its place a new spirit will I give you and put my spirit forever within you you must be made the reflection of Jesus Christ. You must be made in His likeness today. And I will not be content Till I reach that place In the holiest of all With Him Take me past the outer court Into the holy place Past the brazen altar Lord, I want to see your face. Pass me by the crowds of people and the priests who sing their praise. Lord, I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, and it's only found in one place. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take the coals, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take the coals, cleanse my lips. Brother Steve had many wonderful minister friends all over the world who he lived with when he visited them, loved them dearly. Every single one of them from east to west of the globe would have loved to have given tributes. But I've been asked to give a tribute, of course, by Brother Isaac Noriega, pastor of the church in Tucson, Arizona, whom Brother Steve has visited many times, probably the most, and is a special friend to Brother Steve. I hope I do justice by reading his uh, tribute. It's entitled, My Tribute to My Dearest Friend, Brother Stephen Francis. Special greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to the church and to Brother Stephen Francis' beloved family, who we love and cherish very much. We are especially praying for Sister Jenny, who loved him and stood by him as a faithful mate through thick and thin throughout his ministry. We pray that God will comfort her. I know that he will if we allow him to comfort us. God has been very gracious and loving to me, for he has comforted me in the departing of my dearest friend, my beloved wife. When God comforts us, then we in return can comfort others. For the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. 
by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. As a family of God, we feel the same feelings of pain, sadness, and emptiness as you do. For the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. To the bride that Brother Stephen pastored, as days come and we go, we will continue to pray for you that God will unite your hearts together and bring you comfort and strength to continue on the work that Brother Stephen Francis started there in Newcastle. I know that there are decisions to be made so that the work of the Lord will continue on. May God grant you wisdom and revelation in seeking God's will in making these decisions is my prayer. I first met Brother Stephen Francis in the early 1980s when he had, he and Brother uh, Van Zieberg visited Tucson. I took them to see A.A. A. Allen's church in Miracle Valley because I knew that Brother Stephen and Brother Van Zieberg had heard about A.A. A. Allen. I also introduced them to Brother Daniel Rojas from Sierra Vista. Brother Stephen Francis preached for Brother Daniel Rojas and Brother Van Zieberg preached for us. After that, he began visiting us yearly, sometimes twice a year. On one of his trips, he brought Sister Jennifer with him. When they traveled to visit us, 90% of the time she would come with. During their stay with us, my wife and her became very good friends. Throughout the years, he preached many messages that are engraved in our hearts, such as transition and the overcomer's reward. Being part of us and sharing our burdens with us, I felt in my heart to ask Brother Stephen Francis to be one of the speakers in our 1992 dedication services of our tabernacle. We will still cherish and sing the wonderful inspired choruses that he taught us. He was a true worshiper and we loved to worship with him. Back then I had no idea that God in his preordained plan was fixing to unite us together supernaturally in a friendship that lasted over 40 years. As the years progressed, we continued to know each other mainly by telephone conversations, letters, and the over 40 times that he came to visit us, our friendship grew. In one of our conversations we had, Brother Stephen Francis shared with me that God had showed him that our friendship will never be broken because it was God that united us as friends and our friendship was based on God's word. Being in fellowship with him all these years, I witnessed the manifestation of the fruits of the spirit in his life. Galatians 5, 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. As our friendship grew, I got to know him. The times I was around him, I witnessed the love he had for God's people, not just for us. But he also loved and cared for the different churches and places that he could preach to. If you were around him, there was a gentleness and a caring nature about him that would attract you to him. I witnessed joy in him, in our fellowship together, especially around the word of God. I noticed the goodness and meekness that he expressed when he stayed in my home and in the homes of the brothers. Wherever he stayed, he always left a good report. No matter the circumstances, he, was, he always had temperance and he always had a peace around him. Brother Ram said, no matter what comes or what goes like the ship rock, let the storms come, let the lightning flash, thunder roar, Whatever takes place, don't make a bit of difference. Whatever you want to, but he's still saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. When he preached, you knew that he had faith, a deep revelation, and deep convictions in God's word. The fruit, love, was best expressed in the love he had for God's word. He loved it so much that he gave his whole life for it, and he stood true to it. Brother Ram said, I pray, brother, that our lives will be crowned with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, patience, truth, faith in the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit proves that you're in God when you see that life sealed away by the Holy Ghost. Those that knew Brother Stephen Francis knew that God had crowned him and sealed him with the fruits of the Spirit, which was the life of Christ in him. Brother Stephen Francis had left the Assemblies of God Church and he began a small work with a few people. At the beginning it was rough and he struggled much, but through all his struggles, I saw Christ-like character developed in him. Character is to have the qualities and traits that form a person. Brother Stephen went from justification to sanctification to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, thus showing in his life that he received the promise of the hour, the person of Jesus Christ. The word becoming flesh. His life expressed God's qualities and traits. 
the same Christ that we read about in the Bible was God walking in two feet. Without any hesitation, I can affirm that I saw God walking in two feet. Character is the nature of a person. Brother Stephen Francis received God's word not intellectually but by birth. That is why I saw God's nature manifested in Brother Stephen Francis' life. The manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit in his life proved it. Character is the genetics of a person. Brother Stephen Francis was a gene of God manifested among us. Brother Branham said, all at once I looked up and saw I'm not the son of Charles and Ella Branham. There's something calling me like my little eagle, I'm not a chicken. There's something up yonder somewhere. Oh, great Jehovah, whoever you are, open up. I want to come home. There's something in me calling. Then I was born again. That little life was laying there. The life of water was poured upon it. Then it began to grow. Now that old life was forgiven, but in the sea of God forgetfulness to never be remembered against me no more. Now we stand justified as though we never sinned uh, in the presence of God. Communion Tucson AZ. Brother Stephen Francis had been hearing from his theophany and went into it. Character is a pattern. Jesus Christ, the word of God, which is spirit and life, is our pattern. And Brother Stephen Francis followed that pattern until he became a written epistle. He became a written Bible reflecting his word, that perfect man again in God. God's promised word was interpreted in him, Harvest Time message. The word that was being written was manifested in his life. Uh, as he grew in character, the word became incarnated in him and he became one with the word, which is God's pattern. Character displays a relationship. Without a shadow of a doubt, Brother Stephen Francis, being a gene of God, was related to God and as a son of God. As a brother, Stephen Francis progressively grew in revelation that God gave him. God revealed to him that the real church was the bride. And as a minister of the gospel, God had given him the privilege to prepare his bride for the rapture. His whole ambition was, like Brother Bram said, expressed in these words. I've stayed true to him. He's been true to me. I'm trusting in him someday. I don't know for crowning of my ministry. I've stayed true just as I can be. I don't know what I'll, it'll be. I don't know when it'll be. I'll just, and just when he's ready, I'm done here, up here. I hope you'll crown my ministry of this, of letting me take the clothes of the word and dress his bride in the clothes of the word. And for his righteousness, I hope he will crown me. Let me stand on that day, say, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In the last part of Brother Stephen Francis' life, I saw God capping and sealing him into the stature of a perfect man. So when you surrender, a quote, when you surrender completely, being when the Holy Spirit just pours through in these virtues, when you're a living tabernacle, then people look out and say, that's a man full of virtue, knowledge, uh, that believes the word, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, full of the love of the Holy Ghost. See, there he is walking around. What is it? a stature that unbelievers can look at and say, there is a Christian, there is a man or a woman who knows what they're talking about. You never see a kinder, sweeter, godlier person. You're sealed. It was the word becoming flesh and God's virtues manifested in his life that we saw that was being fulfilled in Brother Stephen Francis' life. As the prophet said, when the member is born by the Holy Ghost into the family of God was proven and have virtues in him, that God can see virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, and godliness in him. Then God seals him or places him, and that's when you are a son of God. Blasphemous names. God molded a perfect spirit in Brother Stephen Francis' life. I also witnessed this in the life of my wife, Brother Oscar Harkis, and Brother Refugio Lopez before their departing. These two brothers loved and fellowship with Brother Stephen Francis many times through the years. Now they are all together in sublime fellowship in their theophanies, rejoicing in the sixth dimension. God crowned them with eternal life. The prophet said, my crown is a new body, a new being crowned in his likeness, a body like his own glorious body where I can just live with him. That's a crown enough for me, redemption by judgment. I know that his, his wife and family and the bride that he pastored can attest to this for you saw it yourself. Day after day manifesting son of God among you. 1 John 1, 1 to 2, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest unto us. 
I am a very privileged person to have witnessed on this side of eternity the word of God whom we preach become flesh in saints' lives, such as my wife and my brother Stephen Francis' life, which is the promised word for this hour. The word became flesh and I saw God walking in two feet. Many people today go to church and hear a sermon but fail to see the promise of the word becoming flesh. But I saw the fruits of the spirit manifested in Brother Stephen. I saw the virtues of God in him. I saw an expressed gene of God and I saw God manifested in him as a son of God. In closing, I would like to say that I love you all very much and I will continue to pray for you. I know that it is very hard to go through life's journey without our brother Stephen, one who is such an inspiration to me and one whom we love with all our hearts. As you go through this life's journey, remember that God does everything perfect and he knows best. Like the song says, we don't have to understand, all we have to do is just hold his hand. One of the lights of the world has left us. John 10, 30 to 36, and I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered and said, answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stoned thee not, but for blasphemy and because thou hast Thou being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If, you called, if he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? I was inspired sh of God to share these scriptures of John 10, 30, 36 with you because... I saw these scriptures manifested in Brother Stephen Francis' life. From my heart, I can say, as the Apostle Peter said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, which means a wonderful work. I witnessed God's wonderful work in Brother Stephen Francis' life. The word became flesh in him, and I saw God walking in two feet. I am not prone to emotions or wishing that what I expressed in this tribute to be so, nor was I moved by my friendship with Brother Stephen, what I expressed in this tribute is the revelation that is in my heart and the promise of this hour, which was manifested in his life. If I did not see these virtues in Brother Stephen, or if it was not scriptural, I would never have expressed these words. For what I saw was a true son of God promised for this hour. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God grant you, Sister Jennifer, the family, the church, perseverance to continue on unto the promise of the word becoming flesh, like what was fulfilled in Brother Stephen Francis' life, your brother and friend in Christ, Pastor Isaac Noriega, Tucson, Arizona. God bless you, saints. That ends the tribute part of the service. We are now going to make our way to the burial, uh, to the Roy Point Cemetery, and we've given instructions to the local church of what is expected, and I trust that you will all adhere to that. We are going to need six able brothers. Pastor Desmond, can you come up, brother? Brother Tyron, if you can, to be pallbearers. Brother Mike, can you come back, please, brother? My brother, can you come in? Brother Enos, if you wish, we just need six brothers. Let's sing that song, Ancient Words. Just remain seated as they would go out and then you can leave orderly. I can have the words on the screen. Ancient words ever true changing me and changing you we have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart ancient words ever true changing me and changing you 
We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words long preserved for our faith in this world. You may lead out. God bless you. We will meet you at the Gray Point, uh, Roy Point Cemetery for the burial. God bless you. have come with open hearts oh let the ancient words impart word of god word of god ever true change i